All right, guys, here we go. Uh, let's get this video started. As always, our presentations, uh, whether they're online, on Facebook, um, on Twitter, or in person, they're for informational and education purposes only. Uh, they shouldn't be relied upon and, or used for investment advice. If you need further information on legal restrictions or terms of use, you can go ahead and visit our website. We have that listed out there. I'll provide in the link in the description of this video as well, and you can check that out if you have any questions. What we're covering today is a pretty big topic. Uh, the market's been doing great. Uh, it's been great to be part of that market and participating in gains because our system allows us to do that, the adaptive system. But what is the game plan for your investments when the next market correction hits? We don't know when. Well, we're not saying right now that there is a market correction upon us, uh, but we know trees don't grow to the moon, and so we need to have a plan for when markets move against us, when the when the when there's a downtrend or when there's a drawdown, a correction. You know, think 2000 uh, dot com bubble, 2008, 2009. What's our game plan for managing the risk in those environments? And we're going to cover that in this video. This month's education is part of a bigger list, a bigger series that we run called our Lunch and Learn series here at Client First Tax and Wealth Advisors. You can go to clientfirsttaxandwealth.com and find it. It's listed. The, the way to remember it is the third Wednesday of the month, we have a new topic that we cover that's pertinent uh, both for investors, for financial planning, for tax planning. Um, for example, next month, we're going to have understanding your credit profile and score and preventing identity fraud. That's a big one. That's uh, February 21st. Uh, but we have all sorts of different ones, estate planning, tax strategies. Um, check this out throughout the year. You can go to our website. You'll also go on this website to go ahead and make reservations. There's a button here that you can go to. I'll also provide a link uh, in the detail portion of the uh, YouTube video so you can go ahead and, and access that directly. But what we're focusing on today is our game plan for uh, market corrections. For those of you who don't know me, my name's David Zarling. I'm partner and head of investment strategy and research here at Client First Tax and Wealth Advisors, also the creator of the Adaptive Investment Management System. We'll be covering that uh, a bit today, how that system works, how it benefits our clients, how we use it to manage risk in volatile markets. If you're familiar with uh, some of the uh, cover, you know, things that we've done in the past, um, the last quarterly, I give these quarterly, so four times uh, per year. The last one I gave, I talked about the fact that uh, in my, when I'm not at work, um, I'm a family man. I really enjoy being with my kids and my wife, and I coach a lot. I, you know, coach baseball, soccer, basketball. That's all year round. This basketball season's been my first basketball season off. Uh, it's been my first off season, if you will, from coaching for very, for about five years, and I am enjoying it. I miss being out there with the kids, but at the same time, um, it's good for them to get coaching from someone else. But I'm a big fan of focusing on process, not the outcome. Sometimes we can get too caught up in the score and forget how we score or what it takes to score. So this quote here, focus on the process, not the outcome, is from a particular individual. This other quote here is too, there are two pains in life. There is the pain of discipline and the pain of disappointment. If you can handle the pain of discipline, then you'll never have to deal with the pain of disappointment. And today we're going to be talking about process. That's important. Um, that may sound boring, but trust me, I've got a lot of pictures, uh, a lot of engage engagement here in this video. Uh, stay tuned. You know, if you need to pause it, that's the beauty of video. Pause the video, grab something to drink. Uh, we're going to be talking markets. That's what I'm passionate about. It's the eighth wonder of the world. And these two quotes here are from a very uh, successful person in his vocation. His name is Nick Saban, Alabama head coach. They just won a national title. They even had to stick with their process throughout that game to come behind and, and win that game. Nick Saban, uh, he is the focus on the process king, probably him and Belichick. 218 wins, 62 losses, and one tie. He's 8-1 and one in conference championship games. 6-1 and one in national championship games. He has six national championship titles. Uh, for some of you, that may or may not mean anything, but Bear Bryant, for example, 
is a familiar coach from the past. He's the only other coach to have um, recorded that many national championships. So when someone of this caliber with this type of success rate says, focus on the process, we should probably listen. So here's our agenda for today. This is what we're going to cover. We're going to cover some market bubble and bias uh, information that impact our fear and greed, um, some, some emotions that go back in time all the way to Adam and Eve. We're going to talk about our market correction game plan, how we use the adaptive system for our clients to protect their accounts. We're going to talk a little bit about Bitcoin, which is kind of a topic du jour. We're going to talk about what it means, what it is, what technology is behind it. We're also going to dig into 2018 insights and the return of a silent portfolio killer. And when, if we had time, uh, for those of you who attend our in, live session, we would have a Q&A session. What I would encourage you is if you're someone watching the video and you have a question, feel free to reach out, out to us. You can, call, you can call us. I'll provide the phone number in the details screen at the bottom of the YouTube video. Or you can um, send us an email as well at my team at clientfirsttaxandwealth.com. So starting out, are we in a market bubble? You know, this seems to be a, a common perception given out by the financial media today is the idea that somehow we're, we're in a market bubble. And the, the, the word bubble in itself has some connotations and biases behind it, right? Another term that'll be used is something like the market is extended or the market is overbought. Those words in themselves carry an inherent bias to them. You know, I don't know if, if a market's extended What's the opposite of that? A market is shortened? I don't get that. That doesn't make sense to me. We need to actually have some facts and data to determine, are we in a bubble? How do we determine that? How do we define that? And if we are, can we protect ourselves when the bubble pops? And what I'd like to do is step back a little bit and remind people a little bit of the track record of financial media or media in general. And it's not to lambast or, or you know come down too hard on media, but I think we fail as consumers of information on a 24-hour basis to discern whether they've been accurate or not. You know, when we live life day to day, sometimes we fail to go back and recognize was the information that was provided factual or was it opinion? And if it was opinion, is that really reliable? And if you remember how we entered 2017, it was shortly after the election and heading into the election, barely anybody was giving current President Trump a chance of winning the election. I mean, CNN was saying, was predicting a big election win, New York Times, New York Post. I mean, all these different publications were saying, oh, you know, they're, they, uh, Donald Trump doesn't stand a chance and Hillary's gonna be our next president. When we use data, and, and you can fact check us on this, you know, on our Facebook page, if you go back uh, two or three weeks prior to the election, we posted a video, a five minute video, and why we actually thought there was about an 80% chance that Donald Trump was going to win. And that wasn't based on any type of political, I'm not making a political statement here, like I like this person over another one. Um, that's not the case. We like to use facts uh, to and, and the weight of evidence to make a decision. And when we looked at the data and what the market was showing us, is that there was a very strong possibility that Donald Trump could win the election. He ended up winning the election. I don't know that necessarily, that's not the point of bringing this up is, oh, client first was right and someone else was wrong. It's more, what are we using? What information are we using to make decisions? Is the media the best place to get information and make decisions? The election is just one example of this. Another thing, as we went into the election or shortly thereafter was this idea that the stock market was going to crash. I don't know if you guys remember this, but it was it, the drums were pounding for market disaster by the media heading into the election. If Trump wins, stocks will crash 50%. I mean, this is, this is a direct screenshot from the TV from early November, right before the, right before the election saying, sell everything sell everything. I mean, what kind of, what kind of piece of advice is that? Um, I think this is terrible, terrible type of information to be putting on TV for people to consume who have 401k plans, who have retirement accounts, IRAs, you name it. 
and this is the type of information that's out there. And if you remember, um, here's a chart of the S&P 500 in spring of 2017. And, and just to step back a little bit, the S&P 500 stands for the Standard & Poor's 500. The way to think about that, what that is, is if you go into a grocery store and you fill up your grocery cart or your basket full of all sorts of different uh, products or ingredients or, or uh, different things like milk, eggs, cheese, steak, vegetables, fruit, those types of things. If you put those all in there and then you went out to check, you went to checkout and you got one big price for the whole basket, that's what the S&P 500 is. It's 500 of the U.S. largest stocks. It does a good job representing how the U.S. market is performing. And, and that's the way to think about it is this basket of stocks, 500 of them, and we're tracking the price of it. That's what this is. This chart here is the price of the S&P 500 over time. This chart goes back to uh, 2015, all the way through almost current date. And I don't know if you remember, but in spring, they were calling this the Trump rally. Uh, they stopped calling it that in summer. I find that confusing because, A, what was what was this before the Trump rally and what was this after the Trump rally? And my point in this is so that you understand that the media loves to use sensationalism to draw attention. Um, Trump rally sounds appealing, so maybe we use this type of language to draw viewers or, or have people click on our headlines. So we have to be very careful with what type of information we consume. So that's spring of 2017, autumn of 2017, all of a sudden, Market Watch, CNBC, The Street, talk about the markets in a topping zone. If there's no tax reform, the stock market's overvalued. I mean, even The Street was saying a major stock market correction is coming. Um, I actually don't mind that headline from the standpoint of, we agree, we just don't know when. Uh, when you publish something like this and you read the article, it made it sound like it was imminent. Uh, I would argue, yes, the stock market correction is coming. I have no idea if it's going to be 2018 or 2028. I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I care in the sense that you have to have a plan for that type of market correction, uh, but I, I, I don't necessarily sit there and uh, worry and fret about, oh my goodness, is tomorrow the beginning of the market correction? We have data that we can look at. We can use the adaptive system to identify when there's too much risk in the market and we need to remove ourselves from that. We'll get into that momentarily. But this is another idea, giving you idea of how the media works. They told us to sell everything back here and it rose 16% and then we were in a topping zone and we've gone 14%. So when, what should we have done as, as, as financial media consumers? Should we really have sold everything? Should we sold everything here? Uh, I would argue not. Um, and, we, and we're going to cover in a reason in, in a little bit here why and how we use the adaptive system to identify when we can be in markets and when we shouldn't be in markets. Another common method, so we, we're talking, first we're talking about financial media, which we just covered. Now we're talking about this market indicator that is hitting extreme levels not seen before 1929, 2000, 2008. It's the P.E. ratio, right? Price to earnings is a popular uh, valuation metric used without, throughout the industry. And what I'm going to point out to you here is that it's terrible for timing. You can't use P.E. to determine when a market's going to correct and when it's not. And even the fact that this headline was written here like this, when you see that the media is referencing 1929, 2000, 2008, does that give you warm, fuzzy feeling, those years? These are all market correction years, and it's intentionally in this headline because that's basically what we're saying. You know, When we use terms like plunge, 1929, 2000, that's influencing you into a fear-based response to this headline based on P.E. ratio. So let's talk about P.E. ratio. Many academics will say a price-to-earnings ratio of 25 or more is too high. Some will even say 15 or more is too high. But when we look at snapshots in time, here again is that basket, that S&P 500. This is going back to 1988. And we look at the S&P 500 at that time and look at what its P.E. ratio is. You'll notice that there's periods that it's over 15, over 20. And should we have sold there? I mean, there's some up here that were, that were over 25. But they were the same down in here as well. 
I mean, even the even the the, the big crash here in 2008, 2009, you had PEs over 25. So should we have sold there? I mean, I would argue no. We we should have been buying here, but we have to know when to buy or you know what what system are we using to make that decision? And so really, when we look at PE ratios of the market, um, they're terrible for making a decision on when to be in or when to be out of the market. So another common mantra or a thing that's been preached over and over and over within financial media is how long this bull market is. Oh, we're in the eighth or ninth year of a bull market or the bull market's over 100, month, 100 months. That connotation in itself leads you to believe, well, this can't go on forever if this is such a long bull market. And I would argue with you that um, when we look at history, right, we want to be market historians and understand how supply and demand work within markets. Here's the S&P 500 again, that basket of stocks. It's going back to the 1920s here. You can see this 1929 crash. We can also point out that in this period here, this is the dot-com bust. This is the 2008-2009 financial crisis. We went 13 years nowhere, okay? Same thing back in the mid-60s all the way through into 1982 when we finally broke out of that consolidation. What I want to point out here is the connotation or the idea that a bull market is eight or nine years old and then making you believe that it can't go on like this. I want to point out that this period here, this sideways move, which this is how markets move, by the way. This is completely normal. Uh, think of it like a river or a stream. Rivers will rapid, then they will pool, then they will rapid, and then they will pool. I'd like to point out that here, okay, in 1975, 1974, the market bottoms, it was 1974 through 1982. Okay, so that's eight years. And then we continued on an 18-year bull market. We bottom in 2009. We don't break out of there until 2013 and even more recently. So we've gone eight or nine years. Does that mean that the bull market is over? I don't think so. No, I want to be careful. I'm not sitting here predicting. I don't need to predict. I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not saying, oh, we're, we have another 18 years ahead of us. And even if we did, we're still going to have these other types of corrections along the way. But my point is that we need to challenge and be the antidote to conventional wisdom that's portrayed by the financial media and, and use facts such as price, the price of the S&P 500, as our guide. And when we look at price, when we, when we study markets and we look at supply and demand, right? More supply or more demand than supply, price rises. More supply than demand, price drops. So more buying than selling, price rises. More selling than buying, price drops. And we look at markets like this, this is the S&P 500 again. We're zooming in from that prior chart. Okay, the prior chart here, we're zooming in to this period here. When we look at this, this is 13 years of nowhere, uh, but sideways. You know, one thing you'll hear in the media from time to time is we're heading into a low return environment. I would point them to this period here. I mean, how, how can you argue that we're in a low return environment? Because what was this? Because this went everywhere but up. I mean, it, it was just nowhere. And even more recently, 2015, 2016, there was this two and a half year consolidation. Next, I want to jump to uh, fear and greed. So we've talked about uh, the financial media and their influence on us, and they may not be the most accurate source of information. We also talked about fundamental analysis, such as PE ratio and determining whether something's overvalued or not, and that's not very useful. I also want to talk a little bit about our own shortcomings and I want to talk about fear and greed, these emotions that we deal with within the marketplace. And I have to tell a little story because I kind of laugh when I found this picture of this kid with the mountain of cookies because as a little kid, I would go ahead and you, you have to envision this, right? Because uh, you're only hearing me describe it. But when the plate of cookies would pass around the table, I thought I was being clever and when I would put my hand to grab one cookie, I'd actually grab two and palm one of the cookies closer up to my hand. And, and then I would have two cookies with everyone thinking I had one cookie. It wasn't until I was in my 20s when my mother pointed out to me that she knew I was doing that. Um, I can only imagine the smile she had on her face 
watching me think I was getting away with something when I wasn't. Um, but I want to talk about these concepts of fear and greed. And really they originate in this amazing brain that we've been given by God. It is, when we talk about artificial intelligence or supercomputing, we still cannot match the processing power of the human brain. It is phenomenal. You know, the, the left side of our brain, which handles mathematics and logic, controls the right side of our body. The right side of our brain, which is our creative side, it handles controlling the left side of our body and emotions. This brain also produces a belief system or biases that are created from our emotions. And emotions play, believe it or not, a large part in our decision making. It used to be that everyone thought that the decisions came from our left side of our brain, the logic side. What they found out from people that have had to have surgery on the right side of their brain, uh, whether it's a big portion or a portion that really impacts their emotional uh, responses, people who have lost the emotional side of their brain, the capacity that's needed, can no longer make decisions. So really, decision-making is heavily, heavily influenced by the right side of our brain, the emotional side of our brain. So emotion plays a huge fa you know, factor in our decision making. And I wanna talk about some of the biases that we have to deal with as investors when we enter marketplaces. One of those is confirmation bias. Okay, so the idea, you know, when we talk about is it a bubble or isn't it a bubble, you know, when we read headlines that only confirm our current beliefs without challenging those beliefs with either other articles or even what I would argue uh, using price itself challenges our own belief system. You know, for example, if we read a headline such as this one, hysteria of an overbought market, overbought makes you think, well, that's gone too far. Reading something like this, I, you know, this question here I'd like you to ask yourself, are you in cash because it's a bubble or is it a bubble because you're in cash? Do you see the difference there? Is it truly a bubble or because you've missed out on gains or the market going up, well then it must be a bubble because you can't possibly be wrong. See how the, the game we play with ourselves, tricking ourselves with this confirmation bias. Another common bias that affects investors is the idea of loss aversion. Okay, the idea that when the market or your account drops 3%, it's twice as painful as any 3% gain in your account. And this happens over and over. This is a very difficult uh, bias to get over. If you're checking your account daily and weekly and even monthly, you might be doing it too much, uh, especially if you're emotionally affected like this. You'll want to you'll want to use a system that keeps this under control. For example, here is the full year daily percentage change of the S&P 500, so up and down. So look at this movement of the market up and down, which would be very similar to the movement of your account. These losses in here are really going to mess with you from a joy and pain standpoint. You know, I've asked clients uh, or prospects that we meet with who are interested in doing business what year this was and was the market up or down. The majority of the people believe this is a down year and it's a variety of years that they give me, but this is last year. This is the S&P 500 last year in 2017, a very good market year. And this is perfectly normal price behavior. But if you're, if you're in prison to loss aversion where it really messes you up, uh, it, makes you, you know, it makes it very painful to see a 3% loss, we need to have a system that manages that emotion and keeps the loss aversion bias out of it. Here's another one, framing. Framing is a big one in Wisconsin here. Um, we have a clothing department store called Kohl's and they send out these um, percent off coupons uh, to, to residents in the area and the biggest one you can get that I'm aware of is a 30% off and whenever I get it I get really excited you know oh man 30% off I'm gonna go shopping now um, little do I realize or little do I think about the fact that Kohl's has digital price tags and they can change the price of their products overnight and so as soon as they mail out a 30% price tag, um, maybe they're changing the price on their clothes to match. So I don't know if that I'm actually really getting a good deal, but I, I feel like I'm really smart. And we do this all the time in markets. 
you know, if, if, if we if markets are rising and we say, okay, we're going to get in, this thing is doing great. Um, and it's moving up and yes, we did the right thing. It starts to drop. And this is where we're like, oh, we'll just double up, right? The price has dropped a little bit. I'll just add to my position. It keeps falling. It keeps falling. Oh my goodness. What's going on about this? It keeps falling. And finally we capitulate, right? This is when loss aversion comes in loss aversion. It's too painful. I'm out. I'm getting out. I'm selling market drops even further. Oh, see, good thing I sold. It rises a little bit and we say, oh, it's going to tank anyway. It does for a little bit. Oh, see how smart I was. But then the market takes off again. And here we are back at highs and we're buying back in when we should have, when we should have been using some other system to manage this process rather than using our emotions. An example of this is when you think about 2000, eight and nine, this 50 plus percent drop messed with a lot of people. You know, some people got out down here, some people halfway, and this really scared people. I don't, you know, for you watching this, I don't know how many of you were greatly affected by this, but many people were from an emotional standpoint, that loss aversion, and they may have sold at the exact wrong time or when they sold, think about this, many people didn't get back in when they should have. Um, and when I say should have, I'll show you what I mean by that, by using the adaptive system. But this caused so much fear to recover from that. Some people didn't get back in until here. And maybe some people aren't back in altogether because of all the, all the financial chaos that happened here. I mean, the layman bankruptcy, uh, the things the Federal Reserve was doing, this really, really um, um, messed with people emotionally. And we need to have something to overcome that. So getting a little more lighthearted if I can in this video um, some market major market corrections you might be aware started there's a market correction the dot-com bust started in 2000 2001 the housing crisis the great financial crisis started in 2008 2009 well, what about 2018 um, I'd like to point out some some signals that we're seeing in 2000 2001 the Vikings went to the NFC championship that season and they lost the NFC Championship game, and the market commenced crashing. For you Packer fans out there, I'm sorry for putting this on here, but I had to. 2009 season, or two that, yep, 2008-2009, Vikings go to the NFC Championship game, and they lose, and the market's in a correction. What just happened this last Sunday? The Vikings won in the Minneapolis Miracle, and they're going to the NFC Championship game. So you want to talk about confirmation bias, I'm, I'm asking everybody in the video, I think we should be cheering for the Vikings because if they don't win this NFC Championship game, who knows what's going to happen with the market. All kidding aside, um, of course, that 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 signal, if you will, is, is a joke just as much as uh, I, I want to be careful. I'm not saying P.E. ratios are a joke, but using NFC Championship games as a guide for when we should or should not be in the market is is very similar to using a P.E. ratio for when we should or should not be in the market. So what is our game plan? Right when the market starts to correct, how are we going to protect gains? What what's the plan? Because here's the reality. Here's what we're dealing with. When we look at stock market returns, right? Many places you'll read Yahoo Finance, CNBC. Maybe you'll read it in a book somewhere. Oh, you can expect a seven and a half percent return in the in the market. Well, that's really dictated by extremes. That would be a lot like me telling you when you go outside in Wisconsin, you can expect the temperature to be 48 degrees because that's the average annual temperature of Wisconsin. However, we know that's dictated by anywhere from zero degrees to 90 some degrees. Same thing with markets. It's dictated by extremes. This bar on the left here shows that 20% of the time or one out of five years, there's going to be a 10% loss or greater. Okay. So corrective. And then there's going to be periods one out of four years where there's a 20% gain or greater. Okay. And there's accumulation, there's uptrending markets. We need to know which type of market we're in because we're the likelihood of it being average is actually the least likely scenario. Here's a little bit what I'm talking about. And, the, and this, this is something I need to hit home regarding um, managing retirement assets. So throughout your life, you accumulate and you set, aside money in a, in a nest egg. 
With Client First, we do a great job with financial planning. Justin does our bucket planning process. It's a specialized process that's unique to us. Um, that's something you should come in and have done with us if you haven't done it. But what we help clients do is set that retirement date, right? Most clients, most people can set their retirement date, but you know what you can't set? Is what the market environment is gonna be like when you retire. When you retire, are you retiring in a market like this where the market's rising or are you retiring here and the market's falling? Okay, because, and, and I should point out, this is the S&P 500 again, this is that basket of stocks going back to, you know, 1998 through almost current date. And I'm just pointing out the fact that let's say you retired in the year 2000 with a nice, you know, half a million dollar balance and you now have to start taking distributions on these funds uh, for your income during ret retirement and the market starts falling and it cuts your account balance down to 270,000. This, this type of move, three -year, a three-year move, changes your retirement plan. Maybe here you were thinking about certain things that you could do. Maybe it's golfing, maybe it's hunting, maybe it's traveling, I don't know. Um, that's up to you. But having it drop to $270,000 from this level here definitely impacts your retirement plan. And then think about this, it's another five years until this account is back up to even, and that's even considering that you don't touch this, that you didn't take any distributions from here to fund your retirement. So here you went eight years with absolutely zero return. And you'll notice that it takes an 85% return just to get back to even from a 46% drop. And then again, even worse, another market correction Minus 57% takes your account down to 215. Again, this is assuming no distributions were taken from your account. So taking money out of your account to pay yourself. And again, not until 2013 is your account back to even and 132%. So this, this type of market activity is, it destroys, poor, it desire, destroys retirement plans. And it's, it's unacceptable to be in this type of scenario as a retiree, even if you're nearing retiree or you're getting close. One of the reasons why we want to protect from larger losses is because the amount it takes to, to earn it back. You know, losing 50% takes 100% return to get it back. So here we have this conundrum, right? We, have, we know we live in an unfriendly market environment. We know that um, the news, the financial media is not very helpful in making decisions because they're not really accurate and they let, let opinion get in the way of fact. We know that PE ratios and some of the fundamental analysis is not very useful for timing. It might be good information, but it doesn't help time anything. And then we have our own personal emotions that we have to deal with. So what do we do in this scenario? For us and our clients, we use the adaptive system. Okay, we, we want to focus on the signal and, and avoid the noise. So the adaptive system is our game plan for dealing with rising markets, sideways markets, and correcting markets. Okay, we, we wanna be able to protect accounts when necessary. And so adaptive is what we use. It is unique to client first. This is not something that's used everywhere. And so what we're gonna do is go through a little exercise and how it works. So it gives you a good idea. Again, this is illustrative and educational. When we go through this, it'll give you a, a decent 30,000 foot overview of how we protect assets. If you want more detail, if you want to schedule a meeting to go over this in more detail, we can. Um, you just simply call in and we'll get a meeting scheduled or you can email us at my team at clientfirsttaxandwealth.com and get it scheduled. But let's jump into this to see how the adaptive system works. Again, here's the S&P 500. Right, it represents that basket of stocks, the price of it. Again, price equals fact. Okay, when we go out into the marketplace, whatever the price the S&P 500 is that day, I don't get to argue with it. I don't get to argue with the market and be like, nope, market price is wrong. That's not how it works. Price is price, it is what it is. It's dictated by trillions of dollars, managed by millions of people. And it's it's those, those interactions, that the, the interaction of supply and demand, right? More supply than demand, price drops more demand than supply price rises, that's economic law. And so that's law, that's fact, that's not opinion. And so that's what we wanna to use to make our, make our decisions. So here's the S&P 500, right? We see supply and demand taking place. What we do is we 
uh, try to reduce some of that noise that's in there. The way we do that is this blue line here. We take the prior 40 weeks of price information and create an average. Okay, so at the end of the day on a Friday, we get a new price level for the S&P 500 itself. Then the blue line, we also get an ad another data point, which is the prior 40 weeks of information. And what this helps us do is eliminate some of the noise that we see in the marketplace. The way I would describe this is we're removing our nose from the screen, right? If you watch a movie or a TV show and, you're, and your nose is right on the screen, you're missing the big picture. This blue line helps us see the big picture, where the trends are, which direction they're going. This is the big picture. Then we'll use something that's a smaller or shorter term uh, average. So we have the blue line, which is, is 40 weeks of information. And again, I should clarify, we don't use these exact amounts. These are This is being used to give you an idea of how we think about things, but we don't use the exact um, identifiers because we're not going to give any, ways, any secret sauce. But this orange line here is 10 weeks of information. So orange, 10 weeks of information. Blue, 40 weeks of information. And simply what we do is we simply make a rule. If 10 weeks is below 40 weeks or if orange is below blue, we're no longer going to participate in the market. On the flip side, if orange is above blue, we're going to participate in the market. We like this because it helps us participate in rising markets and protect in falling markets. It's really that simple. Orange below blue, we're not going to be involved. Orange above blue, we're going to be involved. Now, what I'll point out in here is that we don't just do this for the S&P 500. We do this for a lot of different things. Bonds, commodities, currencies. We even look at individual slices of the market. If this, if the S&P 500 is a, is, a, is a loaf of bread, we could also uh, slice and dice it up into different um, sectors of the basket, of you, if you will. You know, there might be a ba portion of the basket that's dairy in your in your basket. Same thing with S&P 500. Maybe there's a portion of that that is technology, and we're just going to track what technology looks like, and we're going to use orange and blue to make those determinations. So just by using these signals, we're removing bias, right? We're using we're using price plus trend, which makes us adaptive. We're removing bias, we're removing news from our process, and we're just being simply uh, using process to determine whether we're in, involved with markets or not, and we can protect accounts uh, using this. So we know, you know, we'd love to grow assets in a straight line, and we talked about those market realities, right? We talked about those bigger drops. And what we use the Adaptum system for is to smooth out that line, right? We're going to use orange and blue, those orange and blue signals to avoid those 10 or those 15, 20, 30 percent, for even 40 and 50 percent drops in the marketplace and protect accounts. So we know that PE is bad for timing. Okay, this is not new news, but yet the AIM system is good for timing. Okay, we can use these signals to be in and out uh, of the market when necessary. When I say protect, what I mean is it depends on the environment. So example, if we look at this basket 2008-2009, when we looked at bonds and commodities during the same time, they also were orange below blue. So we'll actually hold cash. That's not something that many places do. Um, many places tell investors to buy and hold through these types of events. Uh, we don't think that's in a client's best interest. We're a, a registered investment advisor. We have to work in the best interest of our client. That's called a fiduciary. That's our role. And we believe the adaptive system fits into that because we are protecting retirees during these downturns, but yet participating in rising markets like the one we're in now. So the AIM system is good for timing. Bias is not very good for making market decisions. The AIM system protects us from our own biases. It's a, it's a bias bodyguard. It stands between you and, and, and what is believed to be an uncertain market. News, I got to tell you, you got to be careful how much news you consume because it's not good for you. It's not good for your uh, portfolio health. The AIM system, it's fact. It's fact-based. It's based on price. Um, there's no arguing with price and it's based off of that. That's how we, how we identify trends and manage risk. 
So we're going to use that's our game plan. Um, we're not going to use news. We're not going to use fundamental analysis. We're not going to use our own biases. We ignore all that. We avoid the noise and we focus on the signal to manage risk and protect client accounts um, when necessary. But it also allows us to participate in markets. For example, back when we were talking, back when we were, when we were talking about making the decision of getting back into this 2008, 2009 market, this system would have allowed us to participate earlier. Now, granted, we're not grabbing the very bottom. The system's not meant to capture tops or bottoms. It's meant to capture the major move in between. And the way I describe that is, we don't worry about catching a falling knife. We let a falling knife hit the floor. We let the buyers prove themselves and drive price back up. And then we'll happily participate in markets again. But participating here is much sooner than people uh, realize than when they were scared out emotionally here. We can participate in markets again. It lets us know when to uh, be out of the market and in the market. So that's a little bit about our adaptive system. Again, um, it's a 30,000 foot level. There's a lot more detail to it, uh, such as how we identify relative strength and how we identify risk and manage risk. Um, again, if you want to schedule a time to come in and do an initial consultation, which is free with Justin, for because we do them hand in hand, uh, we, we want there to be a financial plan to assist with the adaptive system. The adaptive system is not just meant to be a standalone. So you want to schedule an initial consultation with us. And then we can go over this information with you. And you can do it simply by calling in or by uh, emailing my team at clientfirsttaxandwealth.com. So let's jump into a little bit of the topic uh, that's been very popular these days. It's Bitcoin. Um, I had to throw this picture on here because I laugh um, because Bitcoin is not actually anything physical. Uh, it's a digital currency, although some people who are very passionate about Bitcoin would be upset if you called it a currency uh, because the, the reason why Bitcoin came along was an anti-central anti, uh, banking thesis released in 2008, 2009. No surprise, right? During the financial crisis and Federal Reserve uh, making adjustments to its balance sheet. So this uh, Satoshi uh, writes a white paper and on it is this process of Bitcoin, a digital currency, a cryptocurrency. And for for say, for say using a better term, a better term that we should use is crypto asset. And that's the term I'm going to use. But point being, there are no physical coins like this. Yeah, uh, it's it's strictly a digital currency. Now, a dollar can be digital as well, and in, in that way, it's similar. Um, it's dissimilar in many other different ways. But really, this is a popular topic today. I mean, Yahoo Finance has a whole page dedicated just to ticker symbols of different cryptocurrencies. Because believe it or not, Bitcoin's Bitcoin's the most famous one, but there's a bunch of different um, crypto assets or cryptocurrencies out there. But look at how popular it is. I mean, it's it's on CNBC now. It's a Bitcoin watch. You know, people are keeping an eye on this on a daily basis. So it's, it, it's a popular topic. And really, what is Bitcoin based off of? Now, I have, in full disclosure here, a couple things. Uh, I own a little bit of Bitcoin myself, um, as well as some other crypto assets. And I don't want to give you the impression that somehow I'm an expert on those or the technology it runs on, which is blockchain technology, which I'll do my best to explain in a level that I understand it. Um, and, and the way I would put this is I am not an expert on the internet either. I do not know the different protocols and coding language. Uh, you know, the TCIP protocol that allows me to send an email to you or to create this video and put it on YouTube and then send it to you in a link. All I know is that that technology is useful and I have a broad understanding of it. Same thing with a combustion engine. I can't tell you what the appropriate displacement is for or by liters for oil and how, you know, I understand that a combustion engine works, the, the basics of it using gasoline and need some type of fuel, uh, you need some type of spark. You need, you know, that and that drives the vehicle and driving a vehicle is useful. Same thing with blockchain technology. I will not be able to tell you all the different unique protocols that are used within blockchain technology, but I can do my best to explain to you um, how this might apply in your life. 
because we are actually as a firm, and this is uh, maybe maybe opposite of a lot of different financial advisory firms or asset managers who might think that Bitcoin is a scam or some type of Ponzi or it's a fraud. Um, we don't think Bitcoin is that. And more importantly, we think the technology underneath it, this blockchain technology, is a huge advancement um, for technology overall. And the way I would describe blockchain technology and how it works is if you remember back in the day using Microsoft Word, right? If I wanted to write you a letter and I wanted to have someone else, someone else edit that letter, I would first write the letter, then I would save it, then I would send it over to the other person and maybe I send that, maybe it's far enough back in time where I actually have to hand a floppy disk to someone else to look at that, uh, that letter. Then they would go in, open up the document on Microsoft Word, they'd edit it, and then they'd save it. Okay, blockchain technology works a little bit more like Google Docs. So in Google, in the Google Doc environment, I can be writing my letter on the document, and someone else can be in that document editing that letter in real time and automatically saving it. It's also tracking who wrote what, when they wrote it, what changes they made to the letter. That in a way is called a ledger, right? It's keeping track who did what and when, who did what and when. That's blockchain technology is there's this process for identifying. It's an, it's an electronic ledger that is simply a chain of blocks that document who who did what and when they did it and the power behind this if you think about this is let's say I want to write a program like YouTube okay that would mean I work for Google now there's a potential down the road here that I could on blockchain technology let's say another company I have no idea what we would name it, but um, let's say another company wants to release something like YouTube. Okay, so they put a blockchain out there for different people who know how to code to write on there, just like a Google Doc, but they're going to write the programming for another product like YouTube. So they're out on the blockchain writing, just like they would be on, on, on a Google Doc or something like that. It also allows for smart contracts it knows that I wrote on that blockchain with the coding I wrote and is able to determine the reward for that work. So some type of coin. So a YouTube coin, if you will, kind of like a Bitcoin. There's going to be different types of coins that are there and available to pay people to do a certain type of work. So I may have gone too, maybe too shallow, maybe too deep. I don't know. But as a firm, we believe blockchain technology has a strong future. Paul, Paul's actually going to be talking during the identity theft uh, education that we have next month about how blockchain will impact uh, identity, you know, protecting us from identity theft because one of the benefits of blockchain is you can both be anonymous and retain your reputation online using blockchain technology. So that means, you know, many places on the Internet, if someone is anonymous, that probably means they're being a jerk and not treating other people well online. With blockchain technology, you could almost have a reputation score based on how you treat people, but yet still remain anonymous. It also would impact financial transactions. Currently, if I wanted to send money to one of you, I'd probably use something like Venmo or PayPal. And really what's happening is that what if I use PayPal, PayPal takes that money out of my bank account, right? And then it takes it and deposits it into your bank account. So the bank is still involved. Using blockchain technology, I could send Bitcoin from my phone to your phone directly without it touching the bank. Um, so that's one of the benefits of, of this type of technology. But like all technology similar to the Internet, it's very new. Here's the Internet back in 1969. It just was between a, a few universities who were using it, connecting their networks, and using it to communicate back and forth. Jump forward in time into the 90s. Um, I know one of the popular phrases in the day was that Al Gore was the father of the Internet. That makes some people laugh, and maybe you're chuckling right now, and that's fine. Uh, but the truth is, and again, I'm not trying to make a political statement here. I'm just trying to provide the truth. He was a big proponent of a bill that allowed the use of the Internet between Washington, D.C. and NORAD. That's our defense system, right? 
the, the, the thought process being the defense, our de Department of Defense needed a way to communicate from Washington, D.C. to NORAD in the event that there was some type of nuclear strike on the U.S. that took out our power, power grid and our telecom abilities, and Internet was it. So in a way, yes, he was a big proponent of the Internet. And so we've seen new technology like this come across and maybe even grow into something um, bigger than what we thought it would be. Maybe it would it would turn into something, um, you know, if you think about the Internet in its infancy and then what it was in the 90s, and we'll get into that in a little bit, what that looked like, uh, maybe what we're experiencing now with Bitcoin. But just to give you an idea, we do think that Bitcoin and things like it. Now, Bitcoin doesn't have to stick around uh, and be the only currency. It's the biggest one right now. But, you know, the biggest market in the world is currencies, stocks, bonds, commodities. We do think there's a future in crypto assets. Just so you know, I can't invest in these. I can't touch them for my clients. There's too much risk. Uh, the reason for that is there's, we're still unclear in what the regulations are for it. Um, the taxation, you know, some people were trading in Bitcoin and not paying taxes on it. It's highly volatile. You know, Bitcoin just this week has had price moves of anywhere from 10 to 25 to 30 percent. That's not something I can hold in a client account currently. Down the road, maybe. And, and when that time comes, we'll be make sure to take advantage of it because we can use those orange and blue lines to track crypto assets as well. But just to give you an idea of Bitcoin size versus, for example, this is the stock market right here or physical money or gold. Um, it's not quite as a big a market as some of these other ones. The other thing to point out, you know, if you've got a relative who's, who's in Bitcoin, uh, chances are that they've heard of some of these other ones too. It, there's not just Bitcoin. There's a lot of different coins that are going to be used out there. Um, some of the popular ones right now are Bitcoin and Ethereum, Ripple, Cardano. There's all sorts of different kinds. And our thought process is it's very hard to determine uh, if there's going to be one winner, multiple winners, and which one it's going to be. Maybe some of you guys remember when they on the internet, right? They called it Web 2.0 or the social web. And there was MySpace. Do you guys remember MySpace? And then what came along and made MySpace obsolete? Facebook, right? I bet nine out of 10 people watching this video know Facebook, use Facebook, and co have completely forgotten about MySpace. What we don't know about these cryptocurrencies is which one is the winner down the road, which one is the Facebook down the road. I have some thoughts on it. I'm not going to get into it here, uh, but there are some strong limitations to Bitcoin that could lead it to be the MySpace down the road. We have no idea, um, but we think there's a future. It's just very hard to determine which one is going to be the future. To that point, using that internet comparison when the internet was becoming a big deal, 1995 was the first year back here, think about this, when you could finally conduct commerce legally. Um, I still struggle with that because, man, do I love Amazon, right? I, I order something, I click, it's at my door two days later. Um, but think, you know, back in 1995, you couldn't do that. It was first legal. And look at the run-up. This is the NASDAQ 100, another one of those baskets. In there is these internet companies, and it runs up 1,000%. This was the euphoria, the excitement over the potential of the internet. It's very much what we're seeing within the crypto space, crypto assets, is the excitement about what its future holds. Now, it also crashed, the internet stocks crashed after this, and we can use orange and blue lines on here, by the way, too, to manage this risk, but it crashed, and look at this, you know, an 85% drop brings your retirement account down to 75,000. It's not 16 years later until you get your money back in 460% return. The point being that when this crash happened, did the internet revolution stop? No, the technology remained. Um, email changed right back here was AOL, and then now we got Gmail, which is you know 20 times better. Um, Amazon, even Amazon's a different animal now. It's, it's, it's much more, it's, everything is better on the internet now, even than when it was back here. So, this was the promise of the internet. This was, oh my goodness, we overpriced it. And this is the return to normalcy of what this new technology is. We think something similar is underway uh, with crypto assets that we will see this massive run-up. Um, 
Maybe we'll be able to be a part of it. Maybe we won't. Um, I would suggest that if you are thinking of being part of it, uh, that you understand that any dollar amount put in is something that can go to zero very quickly. You should consider it as good as gone if you're going to do that. Um, what we're concerned about is those young investors. Um, it's heavily dominated by young investors that they'll go through this crash sequence and be wiped out and not want to invest ever again when the technology will remain. So we think there's going to be a run up. We think the technology will be around for years to come and there will be usefulness out of it that will blow our minds, um, you know, 10 years down the road. So let's jump finally to uh, 2018 insights. I don't have too much. I don't have too much time left, uh, but I thought we would cover some interesting um, developments going on within markets now. Um, you may recall that heading into Christmas, everything was about tax reform and how great this was. And this was really what's driving up the stock market. Is it, you know, is tax reform really what's driving up the U.S. stock market? And my point being, this, these are the stock markets of all the markets in the world. Um, I won't point them all out, but you know, you've got uh, emerging markets, you've got Canada, you've got Japan, Malaysia, um, Spain. All of these are one-year charts, and all of them go from upper or from lower right to upper left. So increased demand for global assets all across the world. So is that all U.S. tax reform? I would say something else is going on here, such as the idea that the number of countries in a in the world that are in a recession are it's the lowest ever so this is really a global story this is not a US story more important you know one of the things I'd like to point out going back to this chart of the S&P 500 we, where we talked about the market going sideways here in the in the 60s and 70s and not breaking out till 1982 in a similar situation here what I'd like to point out is some demographics that people seem to forget 1982 when the market breaks out of this consolidation, who's reached their peak earning years as a generation? Baby boomers. This market rises for another 18 years in here. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but I do know that 2013 was the start of when millennials, the largest generation bigger than the baby boomers, hit their peak earning years. So the idea that we're somehow in a bubble and maybe and there's going to be corrections along the way i mean there's 1987 in here don't get me wrong but the idea that somehow um this can't keep going might be just misinformation because you're not considering the demographics that are involved another thing i'd like to hi highlight this might be the chart of the year uh, silent portfolio killer now why are we in markets are we in markets because they're fun are we in markets uh, just for the heck of it um, no, we're in markets to protect our assets from inflation, right? If, if the price of everything else in our life stayed the same, well, then we should be putting our money in a bank account and earning a couple percent because it's the easiest thing to do. The problem is if we do that, the things of price, uh, other things in our life, the price doesn't stay the same. Okay, groceries do get more expensive. Gas does get more expensive. Clothing, shoes, medical expenses, all those different things keep getting more expensive. That's inflation. If we don't participate in markets and grow those accounts, we're going to have our retirement account eaten away by inflation. What I want to point out here is this is a simple ratio of um, inflation protected bonds versus regular bonds that are not inflation protected. And they have the same duration. They're both 70 year, seven to 10 year bonds. And what I'll point out is simply in this ratio, when the ratio is rising, okay, that means the inflation protected securities are moving up or outperforming the regular bonds better. And so what this means, we have orange above blue, we've broken out of this downtrend. We haven't had uh, true inflation since back in 07, 08. This type of move might mean we have some serious inflation on our hands, which will affect things. Along the same theme, is the dollar um, you know back in late 2016 the economist was so kind to print this cover and remind us how mighty the dollar was which marked the exact top you'll notice buyers were stepping in near the 93 94 level in the dollar it has since broken down 
this fits the evidence or the thesis of higher inflation, right? So if the dollar drops, things that are priced in dollars will rise. So here we're seeing the dollar break down. That's a significant event. Similarly, when we compare the relationship between stocks and commodities in relationship to each other, commodities haven't been this cheap compared to stocks since the dot-com bubble or 1971. Both of these periods were periods where it made sense to accumulate commodities uh, because they were at an extreme. So here we have a period potentially where we could see higher inflation. It looks like the dollar is falling and commodities have never been cheaper. Um, that to me screams inflation and that commodities will be rising. And guess what? For our clients, if orange moves above blue in commodities, we're going to own those for our clients. Uh, we don't discriminate against asset class. We like to buy things that are moving up in value where orange is above blue. It's really that simple. Those are the things we want to own. And if that's commodities, we'll own it. If it's bonds, we'll own it. If it's stocks, we'll own that. To that point, uh, a currency, the Australian dollar that is heavily correlated to commodities has been rising for the past year and a half and it's been accelerating. We're starting to see an acceleration in demand for Australian dollars. Same with the Canadian loonie. Um, that's normal behavior because those are um, commodity export heavy countries. So demand for this type of currency also means demand for commodities. Again, uh, an important development. Then I want to highlight bonds themselves. If you remember, if the price of bonds rise, yields drop. Okay, so if the price of bonds goes up, the yield on those bonds goes down. Here's a chart of yield. Okay, so for 35 years, yield on bonds has been falling, which means the price of price of bonds has been rising. Similarly, okay, if yields were to rise, bond prices fall. Bond prices do not go up forever. In fact, this period here is the opposite. Bond prices were falling and yield prices were rising. Some of you might remember the late 70s, early 80s with the interest rates on mortgages being uh, pretty incredible. That can happen again. And yields will not go down forever. We believe that uh, bonds can continue to fall in price and rates will start to rise again. What I'd like to point out about that is when you read or you go on TV, what do they tell you retirees should hold in their account that is quote unquote safe? Bonds. We think that's a huge mistake. Um, you can own we, you could own bonds now, but when this rate when this relationship changes and we start to see rates take off again and to rise, that means bonds are dropping in value. You, there's no need to own things that are dropping in value, and that's not safe for retirees. That's another reason why we use the adaptive system, is we can see when this changes and we can protect from any type of bond sell off for our clients. The other thing I think will happen with the media when this takes place, when yields start to rise again, is they will say that this is bad for stocks. Um, that may not necessarily be true. One of the best bull markets in the stock market was the 40s and 50s. And during that period, because we're stock market historians, the stock market was rising and so were yields. Okay, so higher rates, higher yields does not necessarily mean lower stocks. It could. Um, but we need to keep an open mind and we need to use the data on hand, such as the adaptive system provides to make our make our investment decisions. So to wrap up, we use everything with we use everything with a specific intent. Um, the different processes that we have at client first are specifically meant to be in the best interest of our clients. One of those is the adaptive system, which protects us from financial media, from the news, from our own biases, from the uncertainty of the markets. That's why we use it. We use it to protect assets, right? We can still grow them, but then protect them when they've, when they've, when the market starts to correct. Same thing with our bucket planning process, our financial planning process for retirement. There's a lot that goes into that, and we use a comp comprehensive plan. And we found that clients who do have a bucket plan have a lot less time that they spend worrying about money. So you, you should meet with us and schedule that. Justin is a certified financial planner. Um, not everybody in the world has one of those. It's a unique certification. He's an expert at planning, which includes tax planning, 
estate planning, financial planning, you name it, he has that expertise and we want to help you with that. We're heading into tax time. Uh, not everybody's favorite time of year, but we've got Renee, who's an enrolled agent, and she makes uh, taxes a less stressful time of year. So if you want to get organized and you want our help, please join us uh, and, and, and we'll handle your taxes for you. Next, next, I just want to point out again, these different processes that we help. We also have Chris who handles our property and casualty insurance. We also have the 401k advice system, estate planning by Rob, uh, buck, bucket planning. All these things fit together for your financial uh, well-being. And there's only really one thing missing, and that's you. That's your peace of mind and scheduling time with us to have these different things taken care of for you. February 21st is our next Let Lunch and Learn. It's going to be on protecting your credit profile and identity, and that's going to be with Paul. You can call our number here, 262-335-1700, to reserve your spot. Um, you can also email my team at clientfirsttaxandwealth.com. It's a good time. We provide lunch. It's on us. Um, there's going to be some really good information that he's going to go through here. Uh, it's kind of a big deal. Identity theft has been uh, a big problem um, worldwide in, in the United States, and we want to help our clients and, and you avoid it. So if you'd like to join us, please do. Talking about tax, we do have a $79 tax special um, for those 50 and above. It's $149 for those below, uh, but this is a really great deal. Uh, we don't know many other firms, uh, A, that use the adaptive system, but B, that do tax planning. Okay, One of the biz biggest expenses you're going to have that you should be planning around are taxes. We do that because that's in your best interest. You can call us, call us at 262-335-1700 to get that scheduled. Call for an appointment. We do book, book up fast, um, so you'll want to do that as, as soon as possible. We'll send you a tax organizer to help you get organized. You'll come in and meet with us. You'll meet with, with, with Renee, go through any questions you might have, and we'll go ahead and get that taken care of for you. So that concludes the presentation for today. You know, If you have any questions, feel free to reach out at my team at Client First Tax and Wealth. If you want to schedule an appointment with us to go through, it's completely free. If you want to go through an initial consultation, kind of see what Justin in the financial plan is all about, to find out more about the adaptive system and maybe maybe have a second opinion on the where your investments are currently. Um, we love doing that. We love meeting with people and uh, please reach out to us if you see the need. But thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative.